Insurance Policy Radio, offering a unique perspective on everything, geopolitics, culture creation, the reality of the world we live in. Coming to you live from New York City, your host, Pierce Redman. Welcome back to another episode of Porkins Policy Radio. As always, I am your host, Pierce Redmond, and you can find the show here at American Freedom Radio, AmericanFreedomRadio.com, as well as on my website, which is PorkinsPolicyReview.com. And, of course, you can subscribe to the show through uh, email, RSS, on iTunes, YouTube. You can always follow me on Twitter, at Porkins Policy. And, of course, you can also listen to the rebroadcast of the show later on Friday nights on a host of other stations. Uh, before we get into today's uh, episode, which is uh, going to be jam-packed with two of my uh, favorite people, uh, I just want to thank quickly uh, Kay for becoming a recent subscriber to uh, Porkins Policy Radio on Patreon. So, of course, if you want to support my work through uh, uh, Patreon, you can always go to patreon.com slash Pierce Redmond, and you can become a subscriber uh, for as little as a dollar a month. So uh, thank you to all the subscribers out there. And very quickly, uh, the uh, Porkins Policy Radio bonus podcast, a subscriber podcast, will be out. Um, it's 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 all recorded. Um, I just have to uh, just post it. So, uh, you know, don't fear. It will be out before the end of June. Uh, hopefully it will be out uh, by tomorrow or Thursday at the latest. So uh, something to look forward to. And just a uh, a quick... A note on that, um, uh, when I was re-listening to it last night, I didn't realize quite how much uh, mate I had drunk before I recorded the episode, so I talk about a mile a minute, so uh, just bear, bear with me, I do slow down a little bit later on in the episode, but uh, if anyone is concerned about how fast I was talking, I just drank quite a bit of yerba mate, uh, and if you don't know what yerba mate is, well, don't worry, because there will be a, a bonus podcast on Yerba Mate very soon. But anyway, without further ado, I would like to introduce my guest for today, and that is Tom Secker and Matthew Alford, two people who I hope are uh, familiar to everybody out there. I mean, I know Tom is, and I, I hope that Matt uh, is also, because we, we talk about Matt quite a bit, Tom and I do, um, on our various shows. But um, they are joining me today to discuss their new book, which is, uh, just came out today, um, uh, th- uh, Tuesday, uh, June 27th. The book is out. The book is called National Security Cinema. Of course, we will link it, uh, link up to, uh, Amazon and other places where you can purchase the book in the show notes. Uh, but, uh, Tom and Matt, how are you guys? Very well. Thank you, uh, Pierce. Uh, thanks for that lovely introduction. Tom, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah I'm <laughs> No, I'm good. Thanks for having us on. It's, um, it's, it's nice to be doing this essentially as we're launching the book. Yeah, yeah no, actually, as as you speak, Pierce, I thought I would, without being too much of a build up, I thought <laughs> I'll press the button that publishes the paperback because the um, the Kindle's been available for the last uh, few days, um, but I thought today I'll do the paperback literally while we're on air, so I'm just <laughs> pressing that button as we speak. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> well, excellent. Yeah, yeah. I mean, how about? How about that for a little uh, little action on the radio show? So that's right. If you were listening to this live right this second, go to Amazon and you can pick up the paperback for National Security Cinema, the shocking new evidence of government control in Hollywood. Um, and, uh, and and Matt, you were telling me before we went on air, but the the Kindle price is um, it's uh, discounted right now. Is that correct? Oh yeah, that was the other important thing. We've deliberately put the prices of. Um, uh, the book, both versions, the digital version and the paperback version, as low as they can be set uh, by uh, by Amazon, uh, which is around about three dollars for the um, for the Kindle, and uh, I think a little bit more. I think it's about five dollars for the um, uh, for the paperback. So, we're, and we're only going to have that on Tom for what until the end of the weekend? I think it is. Yeah, yeah, basically for this week. So and then we'll it's put a it good time. To, uh, price. Yeah, yeah, and then the price is going to go up somewhat sharply because we do have a a price in mind but we thought for anyone who wants to show an interest early on wants to support us 
we want to make it as cheap as possible. So please do yeah. today, tomorrow, go to Amazon, check it out. National Security Cinema. Mm, excellent. No, and um, uh, you know, I, I guess maybe I, I got a little ahead of myself, but uh, Matt, it has been a long time since you've been on a show that I've done. So maybe uh, you want to just give the the folks a little bit of background on who is Matt Alfred, because we get lots of new listeners uh, and people. I mean, I know everybody knows you, Tom, but uh, Matt, who are you? Uh, tell the listeners a little bit about yourself. I'm a uh, teacher at the University of Bath in England. Um, I wrote a book called Real Power, Hollywood Cinema and American Supremacy in 2010, um, which sort of applied um, Ed Herman and Noam Chomsky's theory of media to Hollywood. Um, but then since 2010, I've been increasingly concerned with more journalistic matters, uh, moving away a bit from uh, theoretical things. Um, and over the last two or three years in particular with Tom uh, acquiring Freedom of Information Act um, documents, uh, although that's been mainly uh, Tom's lookout, uh, to put together a picture of what, of how the sort of ideological sausage factory uh, mm. works um, in entertainment. I guess um, a lot of, I know a lot of academics who look at uh, the news and who look at um, how facts are kind of distorted in the mainstream press and on television, but there's perhaps less uh, of a focus on the role of entertainment in sort of mangling reality uh, to suit the needs of the powerful. And that's where I've gone um, uh, over the past sort of decade. And I've also branched out into some other um, areas, like um, uh, I produced a film in 2014 called The Writer With No Hands, and did a spin-off book from that, um, also which are um, available for. Oh, I think the Right with No Hands literally came out today as well as a film. Although I haven't been involved in producing that for the past couple of years or so, um, but I'm in it. Um, so yeah, I've done, I've done a few things. Like um, yeah. particularly the last few years has been um, uh, I found sort of professionally really interesting, uh, but usually to, all to do with politics and entertainment. Mm. No, and, uh, you know, it's, it's very, uh, um, you know, I guess you, you were really into numerology, uh, lately, Matt, because we've got, uh, uh, not, not, not only is the book coming out today, but this is also the anniversary, the 20th anniversary of Gary DeVore's probable murder by the CIA. Uh, and, uh, I, you know, I think people will be familiar with, uh, uh, Gary DeVore. You know, Tom and I have talked about it quite a bit. Uh, we were on Ed Opperman's show talking about your book, uh, in particular, Matt. Um, so lots of books to, for people to buy. But, of course, they should all go out and purchase a copy of National Security Cinema. And uh, this is, you know, I was lucky enough to get uh, an advanced copy of the book, uh, which I read in basically a day and a half. Uh, I just, like, couldn't put it down. Uh, and it, it is a, a, a fascinating book for a number of reasons. But, um, you know, first, give us, uh, give us a sort of, like, the nutshell uh, of the book, why you know what are we what are we dealing with uh, when it comes to national security cinema, uh, and why did you decide to write this book right now? Um, because there are of course some some other books out there and other academics that have sort of covered a lot of uh, or not a lot but have covered the sorts of things that the three of us uh, have spent quite a bit of time focusing on. So why did you guys decide to write national security cinema? Go on, Tom, you start. Um. Well, I mean, what, what we're dealing with here is, as the title of the book says, national security cinema. That is films that and other entertainment that promote the ideology of national security. And whether this involves government support or not, there is an there are sorry, an awful lot of these products out there. They really do dominate in a way our popular culture. And that's something that is. It's not unacknowledged, but I don't think it's been acknowledged in a serious enough way, and I don't think people have recognized the scale of this phenomenon, both in terms of, like I say, the government-supported stuff and the just general Hollywood output. So we felt, given that these the documents we've been able to obtain, and given the the sheer number, the sheer size of these operations, particularly in terms of the government side, but also the what we call the, the politicization of this, because 
at least according to the, the normal structure, the normal account of how government agencies operate within the entertainment industry, they are essentially passive, sat there waiting for requests to come in for various different kinds of support, and they just evaluate them on a case-by-case basis with no overall strategy, and they try and work with them and accommodate their requests. What we found is that that model simply doesn't apply. Um, in an awful lot of the most you know, big, influential products where the government is involved, they've made deeply politicized changes to the content of the films in exchange for this support. They've also bent the rules and things where, like with Transformers, they were signing contracts with them before the script was even finished. They were that confident of being able to produce a script that would suit both of their needs. So we were looking at this and we just thought, there's so much here that hasn't been recognized, hasn't been articulated in the right ways, hasn't been emphasized in the right ways. Um, and we've got so much evidence of this that it, it just demanded, I, say, I think, that a book be written. Would you agree, Matt? Yeah, I, I definitely think so. We needed to put something out that reflected the uh, very large uh, uh, quantity of films that were obviously being um, affected by the government um, that we were finding in Freedom of Information Act requests from sort of 2014 onwards. Um, so I think that was really important. I think um, f- for me that, you know, we for years we've been able to identify, um, you know, the existence of something like national security cinema. Um, the idea that uh, Hollywood might be uh, might its interests and ideology might dovetail with that of the state uh, and corporate interests. Uh, and therefore, you know, to see Hollywood as a just a sort of liberal entity, let alone a critical left wing uh, entity is a, a, a bit farcical. And I think in a way around about 2010, I sort of thought, well, you know, I've kind of said all that needs to be said on that. But actually what was different, I think that we can identify now is the specifics of how, uh, of, of how that has been done uh, and when. Uh, it doesn't mean that we've got a full picture by any means. It still, still seems to be we imagine a, a huge quantity of correspondence and um, uh, and annotated scripts that are just simply not available. But we certainly do have enough. We certainly have collected enough over the past two or three years to uh, to indicate, as Tom says, a vastly um, greater scale uh, and a vastly greater degree of politicisation um, and a more active um, role uh, by the Department of Defence and CIA and other entities. Um, in Hollywood than has ever been presented previously. Mm. No, and uh, again, too, I mean, and, and people will get this when they read the book, um, that the, uh, as you were saying, sort of the scope of this is so much bigger than has ever been presented. And just, just for the mere fact that in your, in your book at the end, I mean, you just have the straight up list of shows that the DOD has worked on, movies the DOD has worked on, shows and TV show, uh, uh, and movies that the CIA has worked on. I mean, just sort of laying it out there. As well as, uh, you know, I really appreciated, too, having the um, the actual contract um, that the DOD presents these films with, you know, uh, so you can actually kind of see firsthand, like, what a, what a director or producer is sort of signing away um, you know, in order to get a tank or, or a, you know, an Apache helicopter or something like that. Uh, and again, yeah. too, I think the – oh, no, go yeah, jump in. I was just going to say, Pierce, that I think that's – a lot of the material in the book, and what made it really exciting to write and research was, you know, that, that this material isn't available, you know, just mm. online. You, you know, you could spend a long time looking for perfectly useful information, but you wouldn't be able to acquire – uh, like those kind of agreements, except for the, obviously through Tom's website that he's made available over the past um, year or so. So mm. I, I really did feel that we were, you know, kind of doing the right thing, I guess, in, in terms of providing raw um, material that really would not have come out in the public domain had we not done it. So, mm. uh, yeah, I'm no, and I, you know, I, I would echo that again, too. I mean, in, in the sense that and I mean this in like the best possible way, but it is it, it is a book uh, that I think would appeal to a general reader. You know, just a, just a, an average person off the street that has maybe no real concept of the idea of national security cinema or is perhaps aware that, 
yeah, I, I mean, I, I suppose on movies, you know, like Black Hawk Down or or any war movie, of course the Pentagon is involved on, on some level. Uh, but I, you know, if it, the book is is again, it, it's it's a fast read. Um, yet I already saw myself rereading whole, you know, sections of it um, in the past couple of days. And and picking out again, and we'll get to this a little bit later. Stuff that I didn't even know. You know, you you got a tremendous amount of new information, um, and uh, you know, stuff that I didn't even know of. And I mean, I would say I'm pretty well versed in the in these topics. Um, yeah, well, but again, absolutely. That's that, I thought that as well. When I, when you asked me to come on the radio show, I did have a bit of a moment thinking, well, Pierce knows all this really, really well. <laughs> He's written peer reviewed pieces on it of you know, really high quality stuff, but. But then I did check myself a bit and think, well, actually, you know, me and Tom have have put together a, a lot of fresh material here. And I, I don't think anyone probably, uh, you know, has has this kind of you know, uh, holistic knowledge of it. Shall, shall we mention some of the shall I mention some of the films just because I think maybe your listeners might like to hear um, specifically the, the main case studies that we've done. Yeah, absolutely. Go right ahead, Matt. So there's Avatar. You mentioned Black Hawk Down. Charlie Wilson's War, the Tom Hanks movie, Contact with Jodie Foster, uh, Hotel Rwanda, The Interview, uh, the James Franco movie, The Kingdom, um, and then we've got loads from the Marvel Cinematic Universe, Hulk, Iron Man, Avengers, um, Lone Survivor, that Mark Wahlberg film, uh, Rules of Engagement, the Samuel L. Jackson, the Terminator franchise, 13 Days, United 93, Wag the Dog from a uh, brilliant comedy from uh, with Dustin Hoffman, Hoffman from 97. And then loads of Tom Clancy movies, Hunt for Red October, Patriot Games, Kill and Present Danger. Big section on Oliver Stone. Uh, big section on Paul Verhoeven, who is the brilliant director behind Robocop, Total Recall and, um, and Starship Troopers. And then we've got loads of other um, mini case studies in there as well. Um, and I think perhaps that also we should mention, Tom, that, you know, at, on on the back of this, we didn't just want this to be a kind of lament against Hollywood um, mm. and to sort of just be totally like, oh, the Pentagon's done this, we're getting all, <laughs> this, made it all military. Like we're, we're not, we're, you know, we're not just trying to put a one-sided case. Um, in fact, I think so, uh, someone did once mention to me that about my uh, 2010 book, they said, this is the, uh, this is the case for the prosecution. <laughs> um, but, but, uh, maybe a little more nuance would have wouldn't have gone amiss. Um, and uh, but what we've done there by looking in detail at some of the best critical material, um, like Starship Troopers, and um, like some of the material by um, Clancy, in particular, particularly Oliver Stone, is to give a sense, I think, of um, where these ideological boundaries lie. Yes, it is clear that there are some of these kind of crazy, kinetic, very almost moronically pro-military um, productions um, that have the DOD all over them. Um, but actually then, when you get to the more critical end of, um, uh, of Hollywood, uh, there, are, there is really interesting material and often quite provocative and politically subversive material, but it kind of exists often in weird ways. Like, um, so... You, there'll be unusual movies that are made um, or that they'll be made for very low budgets or um, they'll be made on the break of, you know, in between uh, making a couple of other major films and they just happen to have the stars around. That's kind of what happened with Wag the Dog, which is a mm. curious film. Mm. Um, or you, you, you mentioned like Bullworth where essentially yeah. Warren Beatty was able to kind of not blackmail the studio, but um, what was it? it was sort of in exchange for not wanting to get behind Dick Tracy. He had tremendous amount of creative control over Bullworth and essentially made it in secret um, and was able to get away with it. What, I've actually never seen Bullworth, but uh, reading uh, through the sections in your book, I, I really realized, oh, I should actually just go and watch it. But, uh, you know, that, that's like another way of sort of getting around the, the studio control and stuff. Um, that was something, again, that really kind of struck me. And I, I like, too, that the, the much of the focus of the book wasn't necessarily like this is all evil. We need to, dis- you know, abolish the Pentagon. And although I would be in favor of that. But, uh, you know, you you make it very clear that you're never going to get rid of this. There are, a there's always going to be war movies. There are always going to be movies that require assistance from the Navy or the Air Force or something, you know, this, that, and the other. Again, unless you abolished these organizations, people will always ask them for help. But, uh, and Matt, you've 
pointed this out numerous times in, in your writing and in our conversations too. There's almost no movie that the Pentagon or this, uh, maybe the CIA is a little bit different, but at least with the Pentagon, there's never a movie they get involved with where it turns out to be better. Um, you know, that, that yeah. somehow the Pentagon made it better. And more so, I think you just make a great point towards the end of the book by just clearly stating that, uh, it's, you, they should be upfront about this. They should yeah. state this is a, you know, this, um, you know, a movie was made, you know, with, uh, with the complete cooperation of the Pentagon, or this is a, you know, Pentagon approved, uh, film production. You know, that should, that should be at the beginning, and people should know full well what they're going into. Again, this well, is a big. It, yeah, I mean, it's, it's the mildest reform that we're possibly. Yeah, uh, exactly. Suggesting. Which, because they actually, they would say to that, oh, well, we do admit it because we put it in the credits. It's in big, bold, right. white letters on a black background. Well, yeah, but it's right at the end of the movie, so no one really sees it. So mm. all, all we're suggesting, I think, uh, uh, would be just to put that at the start of the movie. And yeah. I would be really interested to see whether people would still go and watch those films then. And I suspect, in the vast majority of cases, people would be turned off. Um, so, you know, well, at least would have yeah, a, a different response to those films. To doing that. I think people would, would uh, yeah, exactly. they'd either have a different response or, I, you know, I think even even a lot, you know, people, when they're aware that what they're watching is basically one long commercial or infomercial yeah. for the for whatever the product is, you know what I mean? It could be the Pentagon or it could be some pressure cooker that QVC is hawking or, or whatever. It doesn't matter. what. But when you know you're watching an infomercial, you're a little bit more, oh, uh, well, you know, maybe that statistic from the pressure cooker, you know, board of alliance or blah, 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 isn't really all that accurate. Uh, maybe, you know, the, the themes and ideas that are being presented here are not really, um, you know, uh, done uh, in an unbiased way, um, which is, again, I, I, so funny uh, in reading your book. Again, sort of like I knew that this was going on, but I was still kind of surprised was, the level to which Phil Strubb, who is the head of the Pentagon's, I guess, entertainment liaison office, he's oversees all this. I mean, the amount of times that he's just lying. Um, and, I, you know, I, I kind of have to ask, because you, you talk about some direct correspondence with Phil Strubb. What was that like? I mean, I'm assuming this was really just emails, right? You didn't get to talk to him on the phone. But um, tell me a little bit about your correspondence with Phil Strubb. Uh, well, the... That was when we asked him about uh, whether Tomorrow Never Dies had had cooperation. Mm. Um, and we just wanted some further details on that. But he said that there, that there wasn't any cooperation on Tomorrow Never Dies, the James Bond film. Um, but, you know, we could see on the end of on the end credit yeah. there was with thanks to the Department of Defense. I, I wondered if there might be some kind of mistake there. But actually, he, as a kind of double check, um, I also looked up in Lawrence Seward's uh, Stars and Stripes on Screen um, uh, uh, what had happened about Tomorrow Never Dies. And actually, Seward includes Tomorrow Never Dies in a list of, I think, about 11 or 13 uh, movies that had um, uh, unacknowledged uh, military cooperation. Mm. Uh, I mean, I, I find Seward's work a bit uh, sort of a bit frustrating, really, because, you know, unacknowledged military cooperation means... You know, covert. Uh, yeah, yeah. What is that even? You know, it's just like why, yeah. why is that being put in such a bland way as to say uh, unacknowledged? So, now, why didn't they acknowledge it? Um, it just seems strange. So, there are these cases of, and, and this is what seems to what happened. Seems to be what happens with Phil Strubb and with the other major historian on this, um, uh, Lawrence Seward, is that uh, I, I don't think that, that I think lying is a very strong word for that. I think, I, but I would say that they're kind of softballing everything all the time. And when you're softballing so much information, um, you're softballing the the scale. You're softballing the intent. You're uh, softballing the politicization. And so in the end, you know, the, the material that has come out uh, in in mainstream scholarship and from those mainstream spokesmen is just like there. You know, I mean, if you mm. tell people, if you tell society uh, that, you know, uh, movies have been uh, completely ripped apart um, and, you know, lines inserted and characters removed and so on, you know, they're, they're upset by it. And they're, sh- they're kind of like uh, shocked and um, 
and actually people find it really exciting. I think one of the reasons that me and Tom have been into it is because, you know, it, it is exciting to see the way that these things have happened. It's quite dramatic. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, but, and I've certainly found that from doing talks, for instance, I do talks to school kids sometimes, and they're always fascinated by these changes. So say in the case of Meet the Parents, where the CIA asked for the, uh, for the, um, uh, in the scene where you have uh, Robert De Niro's character um, on the wall with all of the different world leaders, as Ben Stiller's walking in and he's really intimidated by all the world leaders um, that mm. his father-in-law has met. Now, the original script for that had um, CIA torture manuals all around <laughs> the office. And that was asked very politely to be removed from that scene. Now, People love franchises like Meet the Parents and they want to believe that they are, you know, innocuous and hokey and just fun. But actually, there are politicized changes there. But it's the same with a whole raft of these things. And when you tell people that they are, I mean, in my experience, you know, really unhappy about it. Mm. But if you sort of say, oh, yeah, you know, sometimes the pension just sort of does this little thing where it sort of helps out a bit with this. Like with a tank and things, and maybe they sort of, you know might exert a bit of, and it's just like what, uh, you know, no one cares because it's sort of put in that kind of nothingy way or kind of mm. academic way that doesn't have any kind of moral weight to it. I think one of, that's one of the things that well, I mean, you've done it in, in the um, in your latest art, article. You know, you bring the moral force to bear, which is you know you don't really want a society that's um, where uh, where entertainment of all things is being manipulated, and particularly when, yeah. uh, what's particularly irritating about it is that you know we, we got halfway through writing this book and we were think and we sort of were like, but why? But the, some of these movies that we're talking about are from the 1960s. Like, what what has the Pentagon got any interest in not providing information about a movie? I mean, what's it's, yeah, it's, I know. Well, yeah, it, it, well exactly. It's, it's, and it goes beyond. Uh, well, this is this. Uh, this clearly isn't about entertainment or about um, authenticity of. You know, well, they wouldn't fly this kind of plane in a World War II movie made in the 1950s. They would fly this plane. It's clearly it's yeah. about a lot more than that. Because if it was just about authenticity or entertainment, then yeah, exactly. I mean, what are they hiding? I, I did. I love that. Um, and that was new to me. The. Um, Chase Brandon, uh, obviously, the, you know, the CIA's man in Hollywood for many years, changing, uh, instead of Ben Stiller finding a torture manual, I love that instead it's a picture of De Niro with Bill Clinton and, uh, yeah. and De Niro's character, you know, with the, some Mujahideen fighter. Like, that's somehow better than a, a torture manual. Um, you know, which I, I just thought was ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like, that's the, that's the compromise. And then, you know, do you say, I mean, the filmmaker, oh yeah, that's, it's so much better. Let's, let's write that in. And again, too, that's, you know, that's not like a, um, that's not like switching a little bit of a line. That's rewriting a whole scene and having a completely different impact on uh, the p- people watching it, uh, you know, it's very fascinating. And sort of back to the, you know, you're just saying that, like, the why aren't they talking about things in the 1950s? I mean, there were also some other just, I mean, so bizarre um, things that popped out to me. For instance, Jurassic Park 3, uh, Phil Strub didn't want anybody to feel any pity for the dinosaurs. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and, and he, he makes his, well, we, we can't have an A-10 Thunderbolt because it would just destroy uh, this, I don't know, pterodactyl or something. Um, I mean, what? What? I can't believe that this man is is um, again. He and he claims that he's. What, what's the quote? That he's uh, he uh, his role in Hollywood is quote like being a minor eunuch in the court of imperial China. Yet he's telling them, no, 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 you can't. We can't have pity for a dinosaur. Which almost made me like wonder, like, is he afraid of like when the dinosaurs come back or something? And you know, th- there'll there'll be a group of people that want to sympathize with them. I mean, who gives a fuck? It's a movie. Um, <laughs> yeah, clearly I, I, it's I, I, not. That's kind of about creating tone again, though, isn't it? Sort of like 
it's kind of disguised behind the, the idea of taste, um, you know, that you don't want to show, you don't really want the kind of real brutality of what the national mm-hmm. security state is um, to be shown in, in all of its kind of uh, grim magnificence. And mm. blowing apart a pterodactyl <laughs> with a massive state-of-the-art weapon. Sidewinder missile or something, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, it is not a good look. Because <laughs> you, know, you don't want to be able to say that, you, that... There's a fine line between saying, you know, we want to be able to, def, um, to, to, to show off our, our weaponry and tearing apart a dinosaur. I mean, mm. it's disgusting. It's, a, it's, it's stomach-churning. And... <laughs> <laughs> so, Even though the dinosaurs are the bad guys in the movie, yeah, yeah, you know, I mean, and, and well, you you even you even reference that there was some, you know there was some sort of DOD memo or or talk about uh, you know they didn't want to have a repeat of Godzilla or, or something, right? Like where it, I, I think this is the nineties. Uh, that, that's not something that we uh, found in a document so much as um, on the the nineteen ninety eight Godzilla, the Roland Emmerich version. Um, which is like his version of Jurassic Park. That's, I think, what he was going for. Uh, at the end of that film, and actually throughout that film, the Marine Corps are battling with Godzilla and firing missiles at him from, you know, fighter jets and what have you. And they found in audience reactions to this that it didn't kind of come across very well. You know, if, if you read reviews of this film and when people, what people have said about it, they didn't like the fact that, you know, at the end of the film, this kind of magnificent, uh, creature is destroyed and killed and that's kind of this sort of unpleasant horrible ending and i have a feeling the military looked at that realized that film didn't portray them very well which is probably Mm. one of the reasons why that film doesn't they don't acknowledge their cooperation on it even though there's an article in their own newspaper talking about their cooperation on the film um but they won't talk you know it's not in any of their documents I think that's one of the reasons that's part of the thinking behind this, so that when Phil Strubb got the Jurassic Park 3 script, he looked at this, saw this scene, like you say, about pterodactyls being blown out of the sky by military gunships, and said, oh, no, 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 that's, you know, we definitely don't want any more of that. The idea that the Pentagon is blowing up magnificent natural creatures (laughs) is just not an image they want to be associated with. And then he also looked at it and he said, okay, you've got this character at the start of the film who is sort of wandering around and he discovers this third island with all the dinosaurs on it. And he was originally a military character, or at least an ex-military character. And they said, no, no, we don't want him being portrayed as military, make him something else. You know, just change his background, change his, his career. So they did that. Um, and he also suggested that right at the end of the film, the Marine Corps turn up on the beach and rescue the people fleeing from the dinosaurs. So the, you know, originally in the military depiction was blasting dinosaurs out of the sky. That ends up with, oh, they're a nice, peaceful, you know, they're rescuing people, they're helping out, they're they're doing their duty. So the military depiction in that film, while very minor and in many ways completely irrelevant to the plot, was still fundamentally changed as a result of military influence, as a result of them changing the script. And, you know, it's not like they offered a huge amount in return for this. It's basically just that one scene at the end when they've got, you know, a few vehicles and a couple of dozen Marines. That's not a huge amount that they're giving, but they still brought to bear quite a considerable influence over that film. So that's what they're capable of. Mm. No, it's funny, too. I mean, you you, uh, you really make the point of this. Uh, or, you know, it just comes across... In, in so much of the manipulation and things, but that, you know, almost exclusively in these films, you know, it, particularly with Shrub, uh, you know, it's all about the, the military has to be either benevolent, wonderful, or, you know, they're just sort of there at the end to sort of save the day. And, and I was really struck by not portraying them, you know, in a bunch of moments, particularly even like Jurassic Park 3 or Godzilla, like don't show them as having... You know, Matt, as you were saying, these weapons that could rip a dinosaur to shreds. In film, we should always, you know, if we if we can, show us. Oh no, we're good. We're about peace, or, or you know, you like the military and like the disaster movies is always there at the end to evacuate everybody and you know hand you know food out to people. Um, in any of these movies, either disaster movies or or even movies where you know there's some sort of like 
terror, you know, like some arch villain takes over the city, the military comes out and they're just there to evacuate and blah, blah, blah. Versus, I mean, reality, you flip on the news. I mean, the U.S. military wants to, um, you know, show you, no, we have the weapons to blow up these terrorists and vaporize, you know, villages in Pakistan or wherever if we, if we have to. Um, you know, CNN and Fox and all these news outlets love showing, uh, you know, the, the night vision shots of missiles flying, you know, off a battleship in the Gulf and soldiers firing tracer rounds at some target somewhere. Uh, but it, it just, it was just an interesting sort of, I don't know, um, comparison between the two, but versus in film, no, 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 we're, we're good guys. Don't show the, the military hardware. Um, which is, I don't know. And it's just a sort of bizarre, uh, back and forth. And again, I mean, I, I, hats off in, in many ways to Phil Strub for being able to straddle, um, that sort of, uh, that line between the military being super powerful, obviously, because we see that every day in reality. Yet in film, it's always the good guy. Um, and I, I suppose, I mean, he, they're sort of winning that battle because many people do watch these films and that's really how they're, they, they, uh, are, you know, they project the image of the military as this benevolent force. Um, you know, and we, you, we see that a lot, uh, in, in many of the case studies that, you know, I, we, we should get to soon, um, where, you know, it's always about, but how can we make them look good? Um, I mean, we can, we'll, we'll just start with one of the case studies because I, I, I really liked it a lot, but the, the Terminator one, um, well, I guess just, just for people curious about the structure of the book, you, you begin the beginning, uh, talking about the DOD, uh, and their sort of history in Hollywood and then the CIA's history in Hollywood. And I think, you know, the listeners are fairly familiar with that, but of course, um, there's a lot in the, in the, in this book. So I encourage people well, to just go I, and I read it. I would say, actually, I mean, we're really pleased with those sections. Like, um, w- it would be very easy to do a kind of, um, bog standard overview of mm. the DOD and CIA's role. But we really put quite a bit of time into that, didn't we, Tom? And I think that, you know, we, we have, um, challenged the existing historiography uh, on both of those areas, um, both uh, for contemporary and historical. And I, I think that we've uh, we've really gone back to uh, all of the, the best sources for that uh, and, and challenged the uh, existing scholarship. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I, I don't think that's just a kind of generic introduction at all. I'm, I'm really pleased with it. And then we move into these more detailed case studies based much more on the um, specific material uh, under the FOIA that we've uh, received over the past couple of years, uh, as well as a few other sources as well that have just never been um, been put together. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think the whole book is, you know, I'm I'm proud to say that it's a well-researched book. So uh, and <laughs> I think every bit of it is original. Uh, um, oh, yeah. Uh, th- no, th- those <laughs> histories are not. Uh, I think, again, even people that are familiar with with uh, the work that Tom and I, have, you know, our, our podcast or have read our article. I mean, there's a lot in there that you will have never heard of. And again, you um, y- you know, you, you I love to be presenting these instances of films that never you've never even heard of because they were never even made. Um, yeah. particularly there was this one, you know, I, I'd always heard of the, um, cause you'd mentioned it a bunch, Matt, the, uh, uh, uh Sigourney Weaver, uh, sort yeah, of crime right. thriller that never got made. But then there was also this, uh, what was, it was like an Iran Contra movie that Marlon Brando was trying to produce. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. you know, that one was even more sort of fascinating. Um, so yeah, no, I mean, I wouldn't, you know, it, it, there's a lot in both of those sections um, that I think even people that, that think they know everything uh, will be surprised. And I do like that you do kind of, um, you know, uh, uh, critique some of the uh, well-known people in that field, uh, or at least the sort of research has been, you know, you mentioned like uh, Lawrence Seward, uh, but there are other people as well, um, you know, where you, you sort of question uh, some of the research that's been done and, uh, and again, present to historical, but also current stuff. But then as you, you know, say, uh, the bulk of the book are these amazing case studies, which I think people will really get a lot out of because you, you break down these films and you show, you know, this is essentially what the movie was trying to make, um, and this is what happened. And, and the case studies are amazing, too, because um, 
you know, it's a great smattering of, of movies that are fairly obvious, like, say, Transformers or, you know, the, the Marvel Universe. I mean, people know that the, the Pentagon is very involved in these. But there's also some great um, examples in here where there's, there's either no known uh, Pentagon or CIA involvement, yet the movies conform to a whole set of um, talking points that they would be happy with. Uh, you know, and, and I, I thought that was very interesting. But talking about the the Terminator um, series first, we we jump with that one because this is uh, so interesting. Uh, you know, you and I'll throw it to you guys, but you sort of talk about Terminator as this sort of anti-authoritarian, anti-nuclear film, which you know the first two certainly are, uh, all the way to basically DoD. Dribble. I mean, the what are they up to? Like the fifth or sixth one? I mean, they're garbage movies now. But talk a little bit about this. And again, to the um, bec- sort of along the same lines we were talking about. Uh, you know, don't don't show these nasty weapons destroying pterodactyls. They kind of make nuclear warfare seem like well, it won't be so bad when it happens. Don't worry. Yeah, I mean, I, th- I suspect that the as the DoD would probably defend themselves, they'd say, well, you know, our intention is not to make um, nuclear war look uh, look fine. Um, you know, our intention is to cre- is to make this more accurate and to show the military um, defending as they all as they always will defending our da 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 da. Hmm. Um, but it's one of those cases where it's a kind of byproduct of um, of having such heavy military influences that they have these absurd things like, you know, we've got a couple of nuclear explosions happen in the film. No one, you know, everyone's handsome. Everyone's really good, good skin. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no one's hair's falling out. You know, the, I mean, in the last scene, I watched it the other day on TV again. I just happened to catch it. And I was like, oh, God. you know, they're literally doing a heart transplant yeah. above ground uh, you know in in hostile ter- terrain in a desert under a bit of tent and it's a successful <laughs> heart transplant you know it's it's just stretching narrative credibility to breaking point uh, and that that like you alluded to earlier Pierce, it, it's just what happens when you have pr men basically come in and, and write a film you end up just with rubbish ideas mm. uh, actually i should em- emphasize i think that's what um uh, Phil Strub is. I don't think that Phil Strub really is um, anyone um, different to a, a you know fairly normal PR person. He's doing his job. You know, he's he's, he's working in that field. I can I can imagine a few people who are in marketing or that kind of area listening to this, thinking, well, you know, of course, of course they do that. Of course, of course, right. that's what you know what they're there for. Um, and I don't think we should be surprised by that. And um, but I guess. The, it's more about what the consequences are. You know, if you're selling toothpaste, you know, th- th- there may be some consequences. It might mean trashy TV or whatever. Um, but if you're selling, if you're selling toothpaste on my television screen, in the end, it's not, it's not that big a deal to me. But mm. if you're selling me weapons, if you're mm. selling me an idea that we should trust this organization or that organization, if you're selling me a war, if you're selling me this is what uh, this country looks like, whether that's Afghanistan, Iraq or Syria or uh, somewhere in Africa, mm. this is what it looks like. And that's what you're selling me, not how to clean my teeth, but how I should react to what my government is doing. That is so much more dangerous. It's the consequences of what these people are doing that is so serious. And I imagine that they're probably all, you know, nice pe- people who are running this are all nice people with families who think that they're doing a good job. And I'm sure they are doing a good job. I'm sure they're taking home a good wage. But <laughs> the consequences, um, I think they prob- I just imagine that a lot of the people who are involved in this are, they, I don't think they're, I think, I, well, I think they probably don't care because I imagine that a lot of them who have been in the military will see, you know, the the idea of American supremacy um, and American militarized supremacy as a good thing. Mm. So, but, you oh, know, no, sure. What can you do about that? I mean, it's it's just and, and so all those well, I, little, I, little lies and those little cho- or the little. Um, you know, sort of half truths or whatever that they keep telling themselves and telling their audiences end up adding up to a whole kind of um, banalization of uh, of media culture. 
Mm. Oh, and I think it's just par for the course with these guys. I mean, this is, uh, as you say, I mean, right, I think at heart, Phil Strubb is just a, a genius PR man. Um, that's, that's what he's really good at. And he succeeds over and over again. Uh, and he, he is able to, to, uh, again, changing movies sometimes where it's like just a, uh, you know, uh, in exchange for like a tank or a couple of trucks. Alter an entire movie, you know, um, I mean, another uh, one of the great case studies or one that I enjoyed a lot looking at was Contact. Um, oh, yeah, because- I, thought that, I was going to suggest that one, actually. Um, and Tom, why don't you take over on that? Because th- that was uh, one that you uh, led and found the material for. I thought it was great as well. Yeah. Well, I mean, Contact is is weird because it's such an unusual film itself. I mean, it is quite um even despite the the DOD's influence on it, it still remains quite a highbrow, intellectual, somewhat subversive movie that kind of challenges the the dichotomy between science and religion, for example. Yeah. So it has, you know, these philosophical dimensions that are quite unusual for a Hollywood movie. So, you know, I I mean, I really like it, to be honest. Um, I'm a big fan of the movie, but... The DOD's cooperation is basically just one scene. You've got a couple of National Guard trucks and a few soldiers in the background. Like you say, just performing some mundane but useful task. So it makes them look benign and competent and all the rest of it. In exchange for this, they looked at the script and they said, oh, no, 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 there's lots of silly things in here that we don't want the military portrayed in that way. We don't think that's that's good for us. So they changed them. And this ranged from... Like, there's a conversation, uh, I think it's in the White House. Um, people will will remember this scene. Jodie Foster has uh, <clears throat> just discovered these blueprints in the alien code from a distant planet. And they're wondering what these blueprints are. And she's all for, you know, let's let's build this thing. Let's try and figure this out. And in the original script, the military were like, no, 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 this is this is going to be a transport device. They're just going to they're going to send in half of their army and take over the world. Or it might be even just be a doomsday machine. It might, you know, blow us all up and, you know, it, it's it's game over. The military didn't like that. So that got compressed down. The lines got changed so it wasn't a military character saying it. It was the national security advisor or someone, a, a civilian government official. And Jodie Foster's response to this where she goes, no, no, this is just paranoia. This is, you know, war of the world stuff. That That line just gets cut. So, again, the fundamental military depiction in the film was changed and so even in a film where it's like i say quite subversive quite clever you know this was written by intelligent people who had a creative vision for a you know interesting and provocative movie even in something like that they can change stuff and it's not just dialogue i mean most of what we've talked about so far is dialogue that that has been changed but there's also a sequence where there's like a, a helicopter is approaching this big wormhole machine thing that they've built. Um, and so you get this helicopter shot and you see a convoy driving up towards it. Again, in the original script, that's a military convoy. And it describes how sort of surrounding this building site, there is the detritus of 20th century war making. And then, you know, rising in the middle of it, there's this beautiful, you know, 21st century wormhole machine. And this is, you know, powerful symbolism. This is saying, you know, we can move on from this. We can move on from the military industrial complex and using our best technology to wage war and destruction. And we can do something better with it. Again, that got changed. So (laughs) they not only affected the military depiction, they did also, to some extent, affect these um, more philosophical ideas that I think are the best things in the movie. And that's in a film where they, they're barely depicted at all. In a film where all they really offered them in exchange for this is a couple of trucks and a few soldiers. And yet they managed to do all this. And you think, they've... I mean, what remains still, I think, is a, a pretty damn good movie. But nonetheless, it would have been better, I think. It would have had that idea of, you know, we're moving on from the military age to the space exploration age, which is a profound and, I think, for whatever flaws you might pick with that, it's it's a positive view of the future. And yet that got compromised. That got, you know, a little bit taken away from it in a way that perhaps not fundamentally, but still importantly, changed the kind of overall philosophy, the overall tone, the overall message to the audience. So 
yeah, it's not just war movies. It's not just alien invasion movies. It's some of the mo- more uh, artistic and intellectually engaging films that have been made by Hollywood have still been subjected to this process. And I think that's something that certainly hasn't really been acknowledged that much before. The notion that a war movie might be war propaganda. <laughs> well, yeah, uh, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If, if you haven't figured out that much by now, then you're probably not going to get that much out of our book. But, mm. you know, if you, if you have figured out that much and you want to know more and you want to know how does this apply to other sorts of films and other sorts of uh, messaging and propaganda, then that's something we really tried to do in these case studies is not just focus on the obvious things, but focus on some of the films that you just probably wouldn't have even considered that the military had any involvement in. Because who would well, have guessed? You know, so who would have guessed pull, with contact? Shall we pull back as well here? Um, because um, I agree with Tom's uh, analysis of, um, uh, of contact there. But actually, you know, we're not just disagreeing about um, a film here and there as well. But bear in mind that the current uh, scholarship suggests that, well, when we first began investigating... Um, around the turn of the 20th century, there was basically, you know, the, the, the idea in, in the available scholarship that hardly anything was affected by the government, by the CIA, Department of Defense. Um, even by 2002, when uh, Lawrence Seward brought out his first, uh, sorry, brought out um, uh, his major book, Guts and Glory, um, it still only looked like maybe a couple of hundred films have been affected. But it's the, it's the, it's the sheer, sheer scale and size of this operation that, um, has really surprised us. Um, the latest count, um, which hadn't even been done for over 10 years, was less than 600 films. But now we're looking at, you know, 800 and something movies that have been, that have had, uh, DOD cooperation. Um, and then even more of the bit, the, perhaps the bigger headline is over a thousand TV shows that have had mm. DOD cooperation. Um, and that includes all these weird ones like Cupcake Wars. And, mm. um, but also more obvious ones like army wives. Um, and that scale of operation was never really known. Um, I mean, there'd been a few bits and pieces that had come out uh, on, uh, FOIA, uh, sites, um, that Tom had located. Uh, but no one's ever really put that into print before. And that's what we first started talking about in around 2014, 15. Um, and that's what we've written up here. Um, so I, I, I do think, you know, we, and we just, and you know, for a lot of the TV shows, and bear in mind, this is just the TV titles, not even the individual episodes. So if you look at, um, right. uh, 24, for example, you know, there might, there'll have been lots of those episodes that will have had DOD and CIA influence. Um, so, uh, but you know, we're really talking about thousands of screen entertainment products that have been impacted by the national security state. And only, you know, at the turn of the century, you were talking about, you know, scholarship sort of accepted. It was maybe a couple of hundred most. Mm. Mm. Um, well, when you're, when you're talking about thousands too, I mean, my, my, the question, my first question is always, how much money are they spending on this? You know, I mean, they've got offices, they've got, you know, just, I, I mean, down to the, you know, you've got offices, secretaries in the offices, you know, you got to buy post-it notes, pens, uh, travel. They've got, they've got to fly together. around all over yeah, the place. Yeah, they're flying the around. Thing. I mean, you know, we're paying. You know, our taxes are going to pay for Phil Strub to schmooze clients in, in Hollywood and get them, you know, go on golf outings and things like that to, oh, well, you know, change this thing and let's do that. I mean, there's a ton of just money. Again, it may not be, you know, it's not going to be billions, you know, like the, it less than what it costs to build a fucking aircraft carrier. But I mean, imagine how many like schools you could build or, or, or clinics or anything really. I mean, you just mm. imagine if you took all that money and you just put it into the film industry, you know, mm. and maybe, maybe give it to a couple of, you know, people that aren't just basically government hacks that will just <laughs> churn out whatever bullshit. Anyway, we're at the break right now. We will be continuing this conversation with Matthew Alford and Tom Secker in the second hour, so stay tuned.
I like very much radio. They're an American institution. American Freedom Radio. And I hope people support American Freedom Radio. And I hope people vote with their dollars and really understand the value of having American Freedom Radio. Because that's my family. If you love me at all, Jack Blood, support American Freedom Radio. Like, my family has literally disowned me in <laughs> American Freedom Radio. Danny and Don and those guys, those are my actual family. So please, please support these guys because they have all the technology. They have all these great things that they're going to do. But obviously, they can't do it all by themselves. So not only would I like to see you support them, I'd like to see you retweet them and repost them and really get involved and get on the, the bandwagon, so to speak, on doing that do-it-yourself promotion because they're a do-it-yourself radio network, and, uh, and we just need that so much. Did you know there are 3 million edible food plants on Earth and none have the nutritional value of the hemp plant? HempUSA.org offers you hemp protein powder. It does not contain chemicals or THC, is non-GMO, and is 100% gluten-free. Hemp protein powder burns fat, builds muscle, contains 53% protein, and feeds the body the nutrients it needs. Call 888-910-4367 and see what our powder, seeds, and oil can do for you. Only at HempUSA.org. HempUSA.org introduces three brand new detox formulations of micro plant powder. Brain Fuel for depression, bipolar disorders, and stress. Total Care, anti-cancer agent that cleans the liver and organs and increases memory. Rejuvenate, invigorates and heals the body, mind, and spirit. These products are your alternative to pharmaceuticals. Call 888-910-4367 and like us on Facebook. We ship worldwide only at HempUSA.org. We all know that they're not telling us the truth. So stand up for your rights, demand the real medicine, and your right to use it and grow it. This is Rick Sensen, and you're listening to American Freedom Radio. What about show business? Show business, completely dishonest, corrupt, and full of shit, but in a nice way. <laughs> Plenty of expensive drugs and perverted sex. If you're going to be full of shit, might as well enjoy your work. <laughs> Then you have the media, not just the news media, let's include them all. The media are almost literally exploding with bullshit because they're located right at the crossroads of all the other bullshit. The media are made up of equal parts, advertising, politics, business, public relations, and show business. These people are sitting right at bullshit junction. <laughs> There's enough bullshit in the media for Texas to open a branch office. And you still have enough left over to start two law firms and a Christian bookstore. What has American Freedom Radio ever done for us? Provide us for free education? Well, that's obviously effective. But apart from reversing the dumbing down of America... All the information they provide is free? What about the free podium for broadcast activists to speak from, man? Uh, exploiting uh, commonplace corruption? They help uh, vulnerable people who don't have a voice? I'll uh, bring you light to uh, important information nobody else does. Well, they never sent so hung up or cut off their guests? Well, that's not fun, is it? Oh, they created a fantastic alternative media source during an era of bad, manipulative, and infiltrated mainstream and alternative media shows and scum? Okay, well, apart from the free education, free information, free podium for broadcast activists to speak from, exposing commonplace corruption, helping vulnerable people without a voice, bringing light to important information nobody else does, and creating a fantastic commercial free alternative media source in a sea of bad, manipulative mainstream and alternative media shows and scum, what has American Freedom Radio ever done for us? Donate to American Freedom Radio today. No rules. No rules. No taboo topics. No taboo topics. No fear of doom. No fear of doom. We are. We are. American Freedom Radio. American Freedom Radio. Hawkins Policy Radio, offering a unique perspective on everything, geopolitics, culture creation, the reality of the world we live in. Coming 
to you live from New York City. Your host, Pierce Redman. Okay, everybody, welcome back to Porkins Policy Radio. I am Pierce Redman. If you are joining us here in the second hour, we have been speaking with uh, good friends of the show, Matt Alford and Tom Secker, all about their new book, National Security Cinema, which is out right now both uh, in Kindle and paperback. Uh, so uh, definitely check those, uh, check that out. Um, guys, is the best way to get it through Amazon? Uh, yeah. Uh, okay. Go through Amazon. Kindle or paperback. Paperback just been literally published and approved whilst on air with your show. <laughs> See, you know, exclusively here on Porkins <laughs> Policy. I mean, that's just the kind of the, the caliber of the show that I produce. Um, <laughs> you know, crazy. we're getting books. Yeah, getting books put out right then and there. Um, and you know, if, if people um, again are a little unfamiliar um, with uh, 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 Matt's work. Uh, Matt was in the American Journal of Economics and Sociology uh, and wrote an article with Tom Secker. Uh, so people can go check that out. And somewhere, I'll try and dig it up because it, it might be like behind a paywall or it disappeared. But uh, we had a good, a great conversation a while back uh, talking about a lot of these sorts of um, uh, issues before Matt. So I'll try and uh, find that and, and uh, post it up as well. But um, we were uh, talking about, uh, we, we were sort of, Elaborating on some of the case studies, which again, um, they're, they're so interesting in the book. Um, you know, we were just sort of talking about contact. Again, a movie that ostensibly you would think, I mean, there's really nothing about the military per se, um, or, or you would be surprised that they would be so involved in this. And Tom, as you kind of, as you, uh, talk about in the book and you were just saying on the air, I mean, essentially for a few trucks in one scene, the Pentagon writes himself out of the entire script, demilitarizes the whole story, um, you know, takes out any uh, or, or some of the most sort of subversive political arguments in the movie. Um, and, you know, again, they, this practice of um, a, a civilianization uh, that, mm. you know, it, and this was another thing that I found really fascinating because it that does seem to happen um, throughout movies, you know. Um, so you talk about that in contact. They don't like that. I forget exactly who, but, you know, a few of these people were military. Okay, get rid of them. You know, make them civilians. Uh, you know, you, you of course, and it, it, I guess it didn't occur to me until I was reading it, but the civilianization of Area 51 in Independence Day, where, yeah, essentially it is all just, I, I, I don't know, private scientists or, or something that are out there. And, I mean, that's so ridiculous because, obviously, nobody is denying that Area 51 is a military base. Um, yeah. you know, <laughs> see, everybody that's fucking working there works for the military. Um, no, sure, it's the Groom Lake Air Force military. Base. That's what yeah. Area 51 is in reality. But, uh, I mean, we should be clear. Ultimately, they couldn't come to an agreement on Independence Day, and the yeah. Pentagon said, we're not doing this, we're not going ahead. And so what they, I think that what they ended up doing was, like, getting an old fighter jet and digitally reproducing it, so you see, like, a dozen of them across the screen mm -hmm. and things like that. Um, so they actually had to go to a quite a lot of movie. hassle. Well, I mean, you could argue it is actually one of the, the best <laughs> of those sorts of movies, um, partly as a result of not ultimately giving in and, and giving the DOD everything they wanted. Um, but you know what I mean? It meant they had to go to a lot more hassle in order to produce this, you know, visual spectacle. But yeah, yeah, the, the civilianization or demilitarization of things. I mentioned it with, before with Jurassic Park 3, the character at the start who discovers the dinosaur island was originally a military character and they changed it to a civilian one. So, I mean, and we Hulk, do talk about... Yeah, Tom? Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, and, and, and Hulk, example, we did... Uh, um, we got a lot of details on that. We got very detailed communications and script notes on what they did to that, and an awful lot of changes took place on, on that film. It's the 2003 version I'm talking mm. about. But this is what they do. When they can't just, you know, remove that, they can't just, you know, have that not happen. You've got to have a guy at the start of Jurassic Park 3 who actually discovers the island. So you can't just censor that out of the script. What they do, or see, it seems a common practice, is, well, we just demilitarize it. We just distance ourselves from that, so it's got nothing to do with us. And so the only military depiction that ends up in the film is either a benign or banal background one, 
or in in some cases a very positive and you know central one i mean <clears throat> this is the thing phil strub says they don't have any like hard and fast rules and i kind of believe him i've never seen anything that would suggest like they've actually written down you have to do this you must not do that i think they do shift around depending on what is the context within the film what sort of film is it so like in in transformers a ridiculous movie about you know alien robots um very prominent military depiction at least in the first two movies and i understand in the most recent one as well which also had military cooperation the one that i think just came out actually um and they're they're blowing some stuff up they're using that military hardware but in that case you know the threat is this monstrous alien robot race that wants to take over the world so there there's no compunction about just blasting them away with impunity because mm. they're something horrible and threatening and they're not well, and they're not they're not living you know mm. they're not flesh and blood Exactly. Mm-hmm. So it's just metal getting blown up. So people don't have the same emotional reaction to that. So they're quite happy for that to take place in Transformers or Battleship or films of that nature. But when it comes to something, <laughs> yeah, where there's a, a bit more sensitivity attached, like I say, demilitarization is something they, they seem to do quite often. That's, they may not have hard and fast rules for what they do, but they do have techniques that they use over and over again. Well, I love to, and it's so much of this demilitarization, it, it's, uh, well, just, just make it some private company, you know, some private corporation, private contractor, uh, you know, make them evil, which is funny because, I mean, so many of these corporations and, you know, things are evil, for sure, but the funny thing is, I mean, they're so connected to the military in reality. Uh, again, it, it just says sort of like, uh, well, don't really, you know, it, yes, we know this is going on, but just make sure that we look good. Keep, keep, you know, again, it, it's, it's very much a, a PR, uh, stunt. You know, it, it's a PR, um, formula whereby, well, okay, you can make some private mercenary firm the, the military force and they can be bad. They can do nasty things, but, you know, uh, and, and there'll be no connection to us, even though obviously, you know, the Pentagon, funds tons of mercenary forces all over the world um, to, to carry out things. And they do kind of throw them under the bus. So I, I found that, uh, again, very interesting in this, this civilianization. Um, and again, too, the, you can make civilians look evil. That's fine. Um, you know, <laughs> scientists, uh, private corporation, basically anybody that's not, that, you know, doesn't wear a military uniform can be evil. That's okay. Um and if they do have a military uniform, they're rogue or they're, you know, they've gone crazy or something like that. Um, there were a few other case studies that I wanted to, to touch on. Uh, one that uh, really struck me and that I, I, Matt, I believe this, you wrote this one was uh, Hotel Rwanda. Uh, and this one struck me because I've always been um, very fascinated with uh, the geopolitics of, of Central Africa, the Congo, Rwanda, Burundi, uh, and I've, I've done some episodes on it in the past, and I've, I've never seen Hotel Rwanda, but my general uh, ideas on it I, were confirmed in this case study, um, that it, it sort of tells a very one-sided story of what transpired in the 90s in Rwanda, uh, and a story that, you know, we're, we're not going to get into the details of right here, but there is, you know, evidence to suggest that there was more to the genocide and other people involved. But this one I, I found to be interesting as a case study, Matt, because it, it, as far as you know, received no kind of like official support from the Pentagon or the CIA, yet it conforms entirely to, uh, their, you know, prescribed, you know, a uh, list of events. Uh, can you talk a little bit about Hotel Rwanda and and what what was achieved with this film and why you included it in the case studies? Uh, yeah, well, uh, we didn't want every case study or everything that we were saying to just keep hammering the uh, hammering the Pentagon, um, and we did think that Hotel Rwanda was an interesting case because um, in this instance it was received, I think, very widely as a very very critical film of American foreign policy, American inaction and self-interest in Africa, therefore not uh, failing to prevent the, uh, the genocide in 1994. Um, but 
looking more closely at it and without making any great claim to um, uh, being a great scholar or historian on the events that uh, transpired that year, it does seem to be very much in line with State Department rhetoric. Um, and I think this is probably because it was based on a government funded book um, uh, which was uh, uh, money was provided for the research uh, by the State Department. Um, and the author of that book um, worked very closely with um, uh, the brother of Secretary of State, James Rubin, at the time. So at its source, it was fundamentally tied to um, to the state. Um, and we also point out that it might be no more than coincidence, but there was also a military contractor, United Technologies, had a commercial interest in the region. And at the time, Alexander Haig sat on the board of, um, uh, of the uh, studio that made the film. So the film gave the impression of being dissenting but was very much in line with with government narratives. I think probably it's just worth mentioning what that that narrative is, because um, the idea was that there had been a fairly straightforward um, genocide um, by the Hutu against the uh, Tutsi in Rwanda in 1994. Um, but recent historiography has, um, I wouldn't say turned that on its head, but certainly challenged the, that kind of simplistic uh, narrative. Yeah. Um, serious historians like uh, Barry Collins and um, uh, also uh, investigative journalists like Keith Harmon Snow, um, but also you know a major um, BBC uh, documentary made I think last year, um, you know really do look into this and indicate that there was uh, that it wasn't as clear cut as that, um, and indeed there is evidence of. Um, uh, that the uh, United States trained the uh, people who uh, assassinated the president in Rwanda that triggered the violence uh, that resulted, um, and that the uh, military forces were coming over the border from outside and were effectively an invasion force that had been um, placed in Uganda, I think it was, since 1990. Um, mm -hmm. So it was not as straightforward as uh, uh, as was being presented in the film. In fact, um, uh, one of the uh, investigators for the um, International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda described the film as uh, propaganda statements interrupted by bouts of acting. Yes, yeah, it's great, that line. Uh, and we should also point out, too, on the uh, specifically Hotel Rwanda, the man that, uh, and of course, you know, classic Hollywood film, Don Cheadle, you know, they can't find an African guy, they can't find someone from Rwanda or Congo or, you know, Central Africa to, to be, you know, in the movie. No, let's just get Don Cheadle and he'll do a silly, you know, just quote African accent. You know, there doesn't have to be any sort of regional dialect or anything to it. Um, the real person that that's based on does not believe the no. official narrative that has been presented by people like the dictator of Rwanda, Paul Kagame. Uh, mm -hmm. And and he, you know, it, it says that essentially Rwanda is a country for Tutsis to oppress Hutus. Uh, and here we go, the uh, obligatory uh, fire, uh, fire alarm right outside my window. Um, and uh, I'll just also quickly um, uh, point out uh, over that noise that uh, Philip Gurevich is, again, I mean, is is – known as the, you know, the world's leading writer on Rwanda. And his, you know, I think it's nine trips to Rwanda. That's it. Okay. It's to the entirety uh, of his, of his time there uh, was always under uh, the auspices of the RPF, Paul Kagame's uh, terrorist group, essentially, that was funded and trained by the United States. Gorovich mm -hmm. never left their, their site. He was always with them. Uh, and, you know, there's all sorts of allegations that they would go out in the middle of the night, murder a bunch of people, and then show the bodies to Gorovich, who, and they would say, oh, these are Tutsis when they were really, you know, Hutu. And uh, like I said, I don't want to get into all that. But, you know, I was very – I thought that was a, a great example. And, you, you know, you also um, – you include um, – what is it? Uh, 13 Days, too, mm -hmm. which doesn't mm -hmm. have any overt support um, from the CIA or – the DOD or FBI or any of these, you know, State Department even, 
But essentially, it follows the script that the Kennedys, this was their shining moment they, where they did everything right, uh, you know, and Camelot is so wonderful, and, you know, Bobby and Jack Kennedy were these sort of, you know, uh, beacons of peace and, and whatnot. And, of course, in any sort of big geopolitical event, there's so much more to that. Uh, and it's not just that these two, you know, all-American boys saved us from nuclear war. Um, so the, the 13 days uh, is another excellent um, uh, uh, case study that you throw in here. And again, I think that's too, in sort of like with Rwanda, it's just like, you, well, you can't speak ill of the Kennedys. You know, mm. even even right wingers and, you know, or, or conservative, oh, you know, they were great because he got shot, you know, both of them. Uh, so that somehow makes that qualifies them to be good guys um, because they were assassinated. Um Another case study um, that I, I wanted to get to, because it, it is, um, I actually um, sadly kind of enjoyed watching the movie. Um, I think because it's, it's Billy Freakin, who's a great director. He, um, French Connection, Cruising, one of my favorite movies. Uh, and that is Rules of Engagement, uh, which mm-hmm. also has one of my uh, favorite, although it is probably it is probably the most racist movie about Arabs or about the U.S.'s relationship to the Arab world. But it's got this amazing line um, where Samuel L. Jackson says, quote, waste the motherfuckers, and they just mow down a, a, this crowd of uh, Yemeni protesters. But, Tom, you uh, I, I believe you wrote um, the majority of, of this case study. Um, so why don't you tell us a little bit about rules of engagement? Well, actually, we both wrote this one very oh, cool. much. So this was a... Uh, um but yeah, yeah, like you say, I think it was Jack Shaheed, wasn't it, um, who wrote Real Bad Arabs, who, mm. who identified rules of engagement as the kind of pinnacle of racist, vicious, militaristic propaganda in Hollywood. And he's right, I think. I, I can't think of a film that is more disgusting in that respect, that has so little concern for the people who get killed and the whole drama is focused on this one commander and whether or not he's going to be found guilty or not. Mm. And the whole thing, you know, it's <laughs> basically they commit a war crime, right, in this film? Yeah, yeah. They what commit happens a couple is, of war crimes. <laughs> yeah, um, is Samuel L. Jackson, who is a veteran of the Vietnam War, we get this you know, flashback at the start of the film to the Vietnam War where he executes an unarmed prisoner of war. Um He is, in the present day, he's like the commander of the uh, Rapid Reaction Force, the Marine Expeditionary Unit, something like that. Um, And they're sent into this violent protest outside the U.S. Embassy in Yemen. And it all starts getting a bit hairy. A couple of Marines get shot. And so he kind of, or at least as we see it, as it happens originally, he kind of loses control. He shouts, kill them all, waste the motherfuckers. And so they kill them all. They just, you know, shoot dozens and dozens of people in this crowd. And he ends up on trial. But as we see later on in the film, they reverse that and they show that actually this crowd was heavily armed and they were all firing upon the embassy and firing on the Marines on the roof, including one little girl. Even she's got a revolver and she's firing at these soldiers. And so obviously they, you know, they deserve to die. Um and so ultimately Samuel L. Jackson is found not guilty, or at least not guilty of the serious charge. So this was a film that was heavily rewritten, I would say, by, by the Pentagon. It always had that spirit though. I mean, even going in from the from the from the off, it was a story that was fundamentally about, you know, the, the guy being on trial is far more important than the hundred or so dead people. Um mm. That's that was always part of the narrative. That was always part of the ethos of rules of engagement. But even within that, there was room for some significant military influence. We obtained several copies, actually, of script notes, several faxes between the uh, Marine Corps Entertainment Liaison Office and the producers of the film that show that they actually came up with quite substantial parts. There is even a a dialogue at the end of the film between Samuel L. Jackson's lawyer, played by Tommy Lee Jones, and the prosecuting lawyer, played by Guy Pearce, where they're talking about what it was like in Vietnam and how long a uh, a sergeant or whatever dropped into a hot zone in Vietnam would have actually survived. And it's something like 16 minutes. I can't remember what the exact line is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is a dialogue that was actually suggested by the military as a kind of, you know, a final point that 
you know, the military, it's, it's a really, really, it's a tough job. Um, and this is something they changed as well. There was a line in the original script where they described, um, Samuel L. Jackson's mission, him being sent into this, you know, violent situation at the embassy. Uh, I think it was originally described as a, a dirty job and they changed that to a tough mission. Mm. So instead of making it sound like, oh, it was always a pretty kind of risky endeavor, it was always morally dubious what they were doing here. It was, oh, no, no, it was just a very difficult situation for him. And that's what the military is all about. It doesn't do dirty jobs. It goes on tough missions. And that, that little very much reminds me of uh, Tears of the Sun as well, um, which we go into in some detail, but not as a, a major case study. But the Bruce Willis film um, where uh, the Department of Defense did not want reference to what they called nasty conspiracies. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, and uh, and uh, I had looked into that several years ago uh, initially, um, and I was aware that there had been this this change, but uh, you know, I hadn't actually looked into what the nasty conspiracies were. And um, Tom and I looked into that and and looked at the uh, the source documentaries um, that had inspired the director to make Tears of the Sun uh, in 2003. Uh, and they were all to do with um, military and African government, uh, Nigerian government uh, collaboration with um, uh, with oil companies, uh, very much based on real life, because there were at the time um, uh, there was a very uh, significant um, scandal at the time uh, with I think it was BP, wasn't it? Um, and Ken Sarawiro in um, uh, in Nigeria. And so it was all very much rooted in reality where um, these military organizations were basically going around clearing out villages. And it happened to be with, you know, it, with uh, it, it cleared the ground for um, for oil companies in the region. Um, so it was all rather favorable to them because they didn't like the villages because their oil pipelines were leaking all over their farmland. Um, and so just by chance, they were getting uh, you know, loads of these villages were being cleared out. Now, in the film, they could have easily gone down that line, but no, even though the director himself had watched these and been inspired to make the film because of these, hard, um, uh, I think there might have been Channel 4 documentary, they were, uh, you know, they, <laughs> he decided not to go down that, that route and to depoliticize. Um, and again, like the demilitarization of scripts, the depoliticization um, comes in at that point in, in Tears of the Sun, um, as there is a similar kind of changes made in, in rules of engagement. Which is so it's so interesting, too, because the, the director of Tears of the Sun also did, you know, he obviously was influenced by these, you know, evil conspiracies, yet takes them out. And it's just funny, he made Training Day, too. Which is all about the Rampart scandal, but I mean, it's, it's, that's sort of like a footnote in the, in the overall movie. You know, it's not, um, it, you know, it, it just sort of, well, it's, it's a few bad apples. Not, yeah. no, no, like everybody in the LAPD was involved in this. Um, so yeah, no, just interesting, uh, uh, seeing that there. Um, so some anyway, of it is what, kind of, like, you can understand, like, with, um, say, say with 13 days, you do need to have heroes in movies. Um, yeah, yeah, and, no, of course. We're writing the movie of, um, you know, the 13 days in October uh, 1962. You probably would think, well, let's make John Kennedy the hero. Right. Um, so sometimes this is kind of not political choices. But I think what was interesting to me in the process of writing this book is that we realized, you know, it, I could be fairly sort of, um, uh, casually sort of imagine that a lot of these changes that are made are done for kind of benign or uh, ignorant or non-conscious reasons. But actually, <laughs> when we found that, you know, so, so much documentation on specific script changes, it does make you more paranoid. I think quite rightly so that there are quite deliberate, specific, consistent changes made you know, they're not just sort of wafting these scripts through and saying, oh, yeah, that'll be OK. You know, they, they are going through them with a fine tooth comb. Mm. Were you, you going to say something there, Tom? Well, simply that um, with a lot of these films, um, it's not necessarily that 
the military needs to look really good, or the CIA, for example, needs to look really good. It's it's also things to do with like uh, um, the general world in which we inhabit. Like with Tears of the Sun, that's not really about you know our government corruption so much, but it is about massive corruption, and it is about the use of violence for corporate ends. So even something like that can offend the Pentagon's sense of what should and shouldn't be in a movie. And it does show you the the range of their concerns. It goes from everything that, from like, we don't want Area 51 in Independence Day, through to we don't want you portraying <laughs> government militias clearing the ground for U.S. oil companies. They have... Mm. It, it speaks to like we were saying before, a kind of shared mentality among these different people. That it's not like they have a simple, you know, Pentagon handbook to propaganda. Um, I mean, I guess they do actually have training manuals on this stuff, but not as explicitly provi- as, uh, as applies to the entertainment industry. Um, so it's not like they're approaching it like that. They're just sort of approaching it with a sense of, we want the world to look like this, we want America's role to look like this, and where possible, and where we've got a prominent position in the film, we want the Pentagon to look like this. So, they really are shaping these productions, and in many ways, the most important thing I think we found in the film is is just how much of the critical or subversive material, or even just potentially critical or subversive material, was either casually erased or just changed, modified, watered down, turned into something where it didn't present any kind of problem for them. And that's, like Matt said at the top, Hollywood has this reputation for being a kind of liberal or counter-establishment culture, but Mm. it it really isn't. And this applies both to the Pentagon-supported films, government-supported films, and to, to a lot of other ones as well, that... They seem to struggle with, when it comes to subversive material. They seem to not want to throw money behind films like that. They seem to not want to market them very strongly or don't even really know how to market films like that because they're so out of the habit. They know how to sell a film with straightforward heroes and villains. What they're not so good at is portraying the complexities of the world and the potentially subversive truths about that. And that applies whether we're talking about war or whether we're talking about corporate influence, whether we're talking about anything that has any major impact on our world. And so the book does, I think we did a very good job, particularly in the case studies, of choosing films and choosing topics that show Hollywood makes a lot of different sorts of movies, but it seems to almost always, not always, but almost always be within quite strong ideological limits. And those yeah. limits are something that are reinforced by the CIA and the Pentagon, but to some extent they would certainly exist anyway. Mm. No, I, I think that's a great point too, because it you you'll hear these stories, you know, if you if you follow Hollywood, if you read Hollywood press, you, you'll always hear these stories about directors fighting with the production company, and we want this, and I want creative freedom, and that does happen, um, and and you know it, it is a reality. But I, I find it really interesting that, I mean, there seems to be almost no fighting whatsoever with the CIA or the DOD. Um, there's really never like a, I mean, occasionally, yes, there are these examples where a movie simply won't be made. But that's usually because it, it's, it's, you're talking about something like Iran Contra, or you're, it, it's such a, a leap, you can't change one line and make this movie work. I mean, this is, you're talking about the entire plot. Um, but and this is something, Matt, we were sort of talking uh, a little bit about uh, dur- during the break there too. I mean, like the relationship um, between Hollywood and the, the pen. I mean, it seems like they're fine with this. I mean, am I right? I mean, there, there. I don't. Um, you know, it doesn't seem as if there's really much pushback. Essentially, the and, and again too, because you see the same directors. You know, you you have um, what's his Paul Paul Berg. Who um, you two of his movies, The Kingdom and Lone Survivor, in this movie, and he's Peter, just gone on yeah. Peterberg, excuse me, Peterberg. Yeah. I mean, his whole fucking career is predicated on basically just make. He's a he is the one of the government propagandists. Um, so I, I don't mean I don't know. Talk about that for a minute. Just this. I mean, this relationship seems pretty great. Uh, I don't see that changing anytime soon. Yeah, in the late nineties, I think it was. Uh 
there was some talk of um, you know this the office at the DOD being scaled back, but actually uh, Jack Valenti, who is the head of the um, Hollywood Union, the MPAA, um, arranged for several um, prominent studio uh, heads, I think it was, to to write a letter of support um, for the Department of Defense and for Phil Strub. Um, because they love having that cooperation. I mean, in the end, the only people who lose out are the audience. And um, so, you know, why not continue to be able to make cheaper movies and more easily by using uh, government tanks and aircraft carriers and so on? And it's, you know, it's, everyone's part of that uh, part of that trip. It's, uh, you know, it, why do we need to hear about on a Hollywood movie, uh, you know, the nasty conspiracies uh, in, uh, <laughs> in in Africa committed by our side? You know, this is the entertainment. <laughs> So, um, yeah, very much. I think that there's there's not really a great deal of inkling of uh, of reform there. I don't think um, because everyone's behind it. Uh, it's people mm. like us sort of throwing a little bit of mud at that window. Mm. No, and uh, you know, I, I, uh, another section of your book that I really uh, enjoyed too is towards, towards the end where you you just sort of talk again more broadly about this problem too, but the, the corporatization of of, of Hollywood. Uh, and the way, uh, you know, like product placement, you know, I, I guess I knew it was, ha- it was a thing, but I didn't realize quite how much, you know, again, it's like alter something in a script, um, and, uh, you know, here you'll get a tank or an aircraft carrier. But then you also just got, like, what was it, a Glock? Allegedly, I don't know, just giving like $200,000 cash to have some character in a movie use their gun. Uh, I mean, yeah, Heineken. One of, my, one of the most hilariously bad movies is with uh, is uh, uh, from Paris with Love, the John John Travolta movie. Yeah, that looks like a it real kind of piece dead, of shit. Which really does. I mean, it, it's it's all built around um, uh, how much uh, John Travolta loves his gun and how his puny assistant doesn't love guns enough. And then eventually, <laughs> by the end of the film, the the puny assistant um, has just blown his wife's head off because she was turned out at the last minute to be an evil baddie terrorist. Um, and then John Travolta gives him a massive, massive gun. And they both <laughs> give each other a big grin. And that's the end of the film. <laughs> I mean, I kind of wish to God that that movie had been more successful uh, so that it all, so that everyone listening to this could enjoy and remember how terrible <laughs> the entire ideological thing was. There, the tapestry of nonsense <laughs> of horror <laughs> that made up that movie. I want them to make the sequel to that. John Travolta did briefly mention, you know, once we, we've done from Paris with love, maybe we can do from London with love next. God, I just, I just want to see that made. It's just mm. such a horrible character he goes into a um i think into a like a like a fast food restaurant and just um and it looks like it's just an innocent fast food restaurant but then he blows loads of holes in the ceiling with his machine gun like imagine you're going you're going to a takeaway and blowing holes in the ceiling but then of course all the drugs come out from the top from the ceiling oh that's uh, right yeah 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 well and, and isn't it it's like a you know uh pakistani restaurant or something like that yeah. or Rasa, whatever yeah yeah you know of uh, course <laughs> yeah I'd like uh, I'd like to do that at like uh find find in the sequel maybe they could sort of find some immigrants who are stashing I don't know a nuclear bomb in a crate of elderberries or something like that. <laughs> Just blows well, it away. you know, if uh, Travolta, if you're listening, um, you know, on, let, get in contact with us. Let us know. Uh, I'm sure you know Matt would be willing to. You know, put up put up a little bit of capital, some time, and we'll develop a script or something. And I guess, I mean, we could do it. I mean, because seemingly, as long as you're willing to put in product placement, I mean, you don't really have to pay for anything. Um, no, you know, yeah. you can just have – we could have Heineken and Glock and a bunch of other companies essentially just pay for the move. I mean, this is – Again, this is sort of a bigger question you talk about, uh, this corporatization of everything. But, uh, I mean, again, I mean, like, let people know. I mean, this, Tom, I'm sure you, you have your grievances with this as a, uh, a fan, an aficionado of James Bond. But having fucking Bond say, no, I don't want a martini. Let me get a Heineken instead. So, you know, I mean, <clears throat> first off, it's not, you know, he's not in Holland. It's not draft. Okay, it's a fucking nasty bottle of Heineken. 
Like, I'll, I, I mean, I drink Heineken. I'm not going to say no to it, but come on. You know, it's, 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 it, it's a fucking Heineken. It's not a, a martini or something. I mean, and they're, they're spending how much money to get that in there? Oh, I can't, I can't remember exactly, but it was tens of millions of dollars. It amounted to an awful lot of money. And like you say, this is the thing now with, with production budgets being what they are, with the competition being, you know, who can make the biggest, most impressive, longest, loudest, fastest movie. Mm. Um, that costs a lot of money. I mean, there's movies now being made for a quarter of a billion dollars. And that's just a production budget. On top of that, you have marketing as well, which can be almost as much again. So these are enormous financial investments, some of these films. And so increasingly, they're relying on product placement to pony up tens of millions, sometimes more than that. I mean, I think on Man of Steel, it was 160, 180 mm-hmm. million. They basically covered the production budget for yeah. a massive blockbuster movie with an awful lot of Pentagon support, we should add. Um, they covered all of that. So they only really had to pay for the marketing. So the yeah. risk for the studio goes down enormously, uh, which helped with that film because it was fucking dire and no one liked it, and it didn't actually make enormous returns. But nonetheless, it turned a profit in part, significant part, because of the enormous amount of product placement in it. And, I mean, I'm in, I'm in two minds about this. When product placement is done in a kind of subtle, non-invasive way that doesn't interrupt with the script or anything that's really going on in the movie, it's just some sort of part of the background visuals or whatever... So be it, I guess. I mean, you're not going to get rid of that. It's better than having advert breaks in the middle of the movie. Let me put it that way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but when it comes down to something like that, where they're having Bond say, oh, no, 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 I'm going to degrade my own brand, say I'm not going to have my usual martini, which is one of the reasons everyone's come to watch this bloody film, I'm actually going to have a Heineken instead. Like I say, it actually creatively degrades James Bond. And yeah. I'm, I, James you know, Bond I have would a lot- never have a fucking Heineken. Some skunky bottle of Heineken? Like, come on. <laughs> Ian Fleming certainly wouldn't have. Ian Hell Fleming no. is turning in his grave over this. And Ian Fleming was a horrible, posh sociopath. Okay, but nonetheless, the point remains. Should a company have that kind of influence over the creative output of a film? I mean, by all means, have him pick up a glass that says Heineken on the side and take a swig of it. But you don't need to build it into that extent where you're hammering the audience over the head. If you want to be James Bond, you should drink Heineken. Um, it's, it's kind of mm. pathetic that that's how they see their audience. That that's how they see us, filmgoers, is they think, yeah, we're just a bunch of stupid slobs who will do whatever we say. Mm. And that attitude pervades, you know, not just the, 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 the Pentagon and the CIA, but it seems to evade the studios and the corporate corporations who are paying for all this product placement as well and the ultimate result of that is films that are again kind of systematically gutted of subversion and creativity and imagination and you look and you see the films that do actually have all of those things they don't have any government involvement and they don't have any product placement or if they do it's very minor you know and or it may not be some multinational corporation you know, that's like, just, you know, I don't know, carving up the world like Heineken is. No, sure, sure. It's someone who actually you know, kind of deserves to have their business shown off in a movie, maybe. Mm. But again, it's these the, the confluence, these the ideological parameters and also the, the financial structures of Hollywood have made it so that these films are very susceptible to these kinds of influences. <laughs> and it's, you do wonder, it's not a huge amount of creative room left not at the top anyway if you want to make a 200 million dollar movie you kind of have to submit to some of this you you just can't do it otherwise um and even the best filmmakers we looked at there's only really one example i guess and you could say total recall which was one of the most expensive films made at the time that doesn't have a lot of product placement and it's pretty much all crammed into the sequences in brothels um Mm. (laughs) I, i can only guess Paul Verhoeven did that to kind of, <laughs> <laughs> you know, in keeping with his yeah. own ideological view of things. Um, but that would probably be the only standout example of a very expensive movie being made that does have consistent subversive political messages that is very imaginative and creative and original. 
And that was largely just because of Arnold Schwarzenegger's star power and the fact he had this kind of massive hold over the studio that he was working for at the time. And he basically said, I want to choose the director. I want to spend all this money. And and when they ran out of money, he went to them and said, no, 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 you've got to spend more money. Mm. Um, That's how it actually happened. And that's so unusual. That's so rare for a film that costs, you know, at the top end to actually have that kind of creative freedom. Um, and I'm not sure it's... There are several cases of, um, of where there is apparent um, uh, subversive messages, but they've been really dulled down if you look at the details. One of the ones that we haven't mentioned is Avatar. Um, and I think that's probably quite a good case study, don't you think, Tom, that you, again, you mm. found a lot of documentation about that from the DOD. Um, and, you know, that was hailed as being... You know, the left-wing vipers of Hollywood have been let off. Yeah, yeah. Um, You know, this is, a you know, an anti-military, you know, the military are sort of destroying this civilization of peace-loving people. And, you know, on the surface of it, it certainly does look like that. Um, And, you know, maybe overall you could sort of put it in that box of being kind of liberal or lefty-wingy or whatever. But then you sort of look at, you know, the compromises that it did make and how far it could have gone. Uh, with that message and it's, it's kind of more of a it's kind of a, a slap in the face with a small wet kipper it's kind of nothing <laughs> it, for, so for example um you know the uh they make no link whatsoever to the real world even though there was a, a, a tribe of people that were in exactly the same situation uh, that this organization survival international was um that had paid i think twenty thousand dollars to put um, a massive advert in, was it Hollywood Reporter, Tom? Um, I think to, so, yeah. Say, you know, Please help the real, uh, the real Navi, the real Avatar. Um, you know, no, none of the filmmakers, James Cameron, didn't say anything, you know, no response whatsoever to that. Um, you know, this was ultimately a, a film that was made by Fox. The Rupert Murdoch's reaction to the film was, you know, it wasn't sort of, you know, oh my goodness, what's going to happen? You know, we've got a left wing film on our hands. It was simply, oh yeah, we could use the graphics that are used in this to um, uh, to make better football games, you know, well, right? Know, oh, and and sell games. Burger King or some shit. And sell, but yeah, and I think yeah, was it McDonald's yeah. or one of it, you know? And um, mm-hmm. so, I, and then there were a few little lines in there that looks, you know, this is one of the ones that we couldn't get um, specific script changes on because, you know, bear in mind that part of this story is that you know they're still holding out on us a lot about the mm. actual material. It's taken a, two or three years for us to, to get enough to be able to substantiate the major points in our, in our case and to, to, to produce enough case studies. But they're still holding out on us on a lot of things. We suspect that some of the lines that are changed in Avatar are, were the direct result of the Department of Defense. So, for example, I think they talk about, they make a specific thing saying um, that the military are fighting for freedom back on Earth but that this sort of the baddie military um, in Avatar <laughs> are a kind of like sort of private offshoot militia, a bit like they keep trying to civilianize everything that they don't like. You know, they've kind of sort of said, oh, yeah, it's this, you know, kind of, you know, bad apple type of uh, type of br- brigade. Mm. So, yes, it does still look sort of have all the kind of a lot of the look of a left wing film, uh, but you know, ultimately you drill down into a lot of those details of it and, you know, well, I mean, just look, you know, what, what effect of any kind, what kind of awareness or ways, even the basic, you know, has it raised awareness of environmental issues? I don't no. think so. I mean, I, from, from, I've seen nothing to suggest. I, I talked about it in a, in a seminar with a group of film students a, a few months ago and, you know, they were just so, they almost glazed over with Avatar and they, they all, they, I didn't say it, they were saying, can anyone remember a line from Avatar? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> How much co- they, they they were saying to me? There's this. This is the film with the least amount of cultural resonance ever. Particularly mm. bearing in mind that it was the most successful movie ever. So how yeah. did that happen? And I think that happened in part because ultimately the the makers of that film didn't really have the courage of their conviction they didn't really care it was all a mishmash of compromise and nothing so the one line that i remember and always stuck out to me in avatar is the like psychotic you know cigar chewing 
military guy that's going to, you know, massacre all the aliens. He uh he he makes some reference to uh uh fighting in of all places Nigeria. <laughs> um yeah. that was the one thing that I you know again it's sort of like these like hints of this or something, you know, that this sort of uh telling you you know this is this is what's really going that was the one thing that kind of stuck out in my mind. But other than that, I mean Avatar is such garbage. Um, yet I think it, it does, it is very effective in terms of, uh, y- like achieving many of the Pentagon's goals and all that. And if nothing else, they sold a lot of, you know, burgers at Burger King. Um, mm. you know, so that's always good. You know, there's always a Burger King at a, at a U.S. military base, you know, um, like what, you know, like the, what, like in Guantanamo Bay, you can go to McDonald's. Um, mm. you know, so, and again, just that, that like sick, sort of uh, relationship between the corporate world, the military, and that's basically what these movies are, you know, um, is, uh, you know, you'll get, uh, you get, you know, change this line, you get a tank, here's a couple million dollars, can we get a Heineken in here, <laughs> you know, and, and that's sort of mm-hmm. where filmmaking is. Um, I mean, briefly, because um, we're, we're getting up towards the end here, I mean, you do touch on some of, uh, you know, I get, you know, what we might call Mavericks, um, like an, even like an Oliver Stone, uh, and more importantly, I think, uh, Paul Verhoeven. I mean, what, what, you know, why did you want to include, um, those, uh, directors in this? Um, because it does kind of leave you with a, there is some hope out there. Uh, particularly, I think Paul Verhoeven was just amazing. But, you know, uh, talk about the, the, some of the positive that there is a, there is, there are some people that are trying to kind of push the envelope and make real statements in movies. Uh, I'll go first if you like. Um, I would say, uh, well, first of all, I'd say I have a bit of caution about, um, any director, whether from the left or right, whether a truth teller or whatever, making statements in movies. I don't really want directors to make statements in movies. I just want mm. movies. To, I, I want entertainment to be entertainment. And I think there's a bit of a slippery slope there where, if we start to say, oh, well, we want films like this that are, say, anti-war, for example, which happens to be, you know, part of my philosophy of life, you know, well, things will be good if movies start yeah. reflecting my view more. You know, <laughs> no, that's not the point. You know, we should have a free system. And it happens that under a free system and a less uh, um, sort of um, uh, a, a system that where uh, people who are creating films are more able to do specifically what they want to do in their original vision. You know, it happens that there probably would be a bit of a shift to the left in uh, on screen. But no, I, I, I just think people should be allowed to do you know, what they want to do. Uh, in terms of Oliver Stone, um, I mean, he's, I think, quite clearly a very, very innovative uh, filmmaker going right back to Platoon and then particularly in JFK. I mean, the way that he was using editing techniques there, and you know, a real pioneer of of of, uh, of cinema. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, th- there is a lot of uh, there is still a lot of material out there that is you know really inventive and interesting and powerful. And Oliver Stone and Paul Verhoeven are two uh, great exponents of that. I mean, I I think Starship Troopers, really Verhoeven's movie, is uh, you know one of the great sort of subversive, funny. Films, particularly in terms of you know, as a film that has been under um, you know uh, underexposed, uh, you mm-hmm. know, fight giant arachnids in space, but it's all kind of like there's a subtext that it's really the humans' fault all along because they sort of stirred up the nest, um, mm-hmm. but no one really pays any attention to that issue. Um, I mean, mm-hmm. it's quite it's just a funny idea. Um, and totally <laughs> recall as um, as Tom said, I'd say in terms of like massive budget films, you know. Uh, that's a particularly sort of well crafted and, and and sort of funny and exciting and accessible piece of work. Um, I think one of the interesting things about Oliver Stone, sorry to be da- a downer on it, but um, you know he did have a break after making Nixon in 1995, um, where he just for about it was around about 20 years he just didn't really make anything and then he came up with um snowden in 2016 2015 was it um mm. and, but you know a, 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 there was two decades really <clears throat> where the only sort of subversive material he did was um you know, a couple of little documentaries one about hugo chavez and one about um uh fidel castro 
and you know they were sort of off the radar you know no one paid any attention to them mm. um and yeah he then did get back into doing you know untold history uh series which was you know really very good um but i wondered what you know why he floundered for that period of time um and i kind of guessed that you know he must have just lost it a bit you know and just struggled um but he admitted it uh, a couple of months ago um, in a really moving speech. He said, you know, most of the time when you're fighting up against these um, these wages of war, um, as I have all my life, you get your ass kicked. <laughs> um, but it's still worth trying. And it was a mm. beautiful speech. And it I, I felt perhaps a little bit harsh to, have, you know, sort of said that. I don't think I said that all of a sudden sold out. But do you know what I mean? Like I sort of sure. said, oh, you know, he hasn't, you know, hasn't done anything for 15 years or 20, you know, coming up 20 mm. years. But it's understandable. He seemed like a really kind of decent person who really was trying to fight for at least his vision of the truth and committed to it and still working hard in, in, into his um, retirement, what should be a retirement age. Um, but, yeah, he obviously felt the, the pressure of doing it. I mean, the, the, re- the reaction to JFK, the movie, you know, was thousands and thousands and thousands of column inches a lot of it calling him a false a falsifier of history and a, an idiot and uh, you know everything and it's got to take its burden on you, you know same with sure, michael sure. moore There's, michael moore was an interesting case as well i mean I, I, I kind of as a human being i get the impression that oliver stone's a, a really great artist that michael moore's a little bit perhaps to, not to everyone's taste but you know he had um uh, manure dumped on his home soon after making <laughs> 9-11 he had death threats he had to take self-defense classes and you know mm. had to have uh, security guards around him because of all this you know it's not a nice path if you if you if you want to go down that route even as someone who is a celebrity um mm. you know and again <laughs> you don't and, and even with michael moore i mean um, julian assange you know all these, these people mm. are, they are effectively celebrities but they're their fame does not really protect them from, at least from the psychological, but sometimes the physical um, perils that come with that. No, I was going to say, even even with the case of Michael Moore, I mean, Fahrenheit 9-11, for all of its controversy, is fairly tame in many of its assert. You know, I mean, he could have gone a lot, um, you know, deeper in, into some of the causes and, and stuff, I mean, of the Iraq war, and yet still death threats, as you say, and, you know, shit on his doorstep and threatening his wife and blah, blah, blah. Um, we, we are getting up. Uh, I think we're going to probably uh, almost run out of time completely. Um, so um, uh, quickly, where can uh, people go to um, get a copy of your book? Uh, well, I think we may have just lost Matt, so I'll say. I mean, <laughs> it's, it's, on, it's on Amazon. Search National Security Cinema on Amazon and it'll pop right up. Or if you search either Matt Olford or Tom Secker, you'll find it equally. So, yeah, um, like we say, it's going to be available at this low, low introductory price for a few more days yet. So now is a very, very good time to get it because the price is going to go up quite a bit. And just uh, as we've been talking about, there's a lot in there. There's a lot in there about the various ideological pressures on the entertainment industry, the various confines these people have to work within, and the massive creative compromises that have to be made. But also, like you say, not to be too down on it, there are glimmers of hope. There are very good films out there. We talk about things like The East and Kill the Messenger, recent examples. Very politically subversive, very well-made, beautiful pieces of entertainment beautiful pieces of cinema so it is possible it's just (laughs) very difficult because of all of these different things we've been talking about it just makes it very difficult for people in hollywood to really push for that and get you know serious money behind something that runs counter to this and so yeah yeah just to return to that point the notion of hollywood as a counterculture (laughs) or counter established culture um I, i think we've hopefully stuck a big fat nail in the coffin of that idea with this book if nothing else so yeah national security cinema please check it out excellent excellent uh well thank you tom thank you matt for joining me um we will be gone next tuesday for the fourth of july but i will be back on the 11th with uh keelan balderson so uh stay tuned for that
information you can trust. This is American Freedom Radio. Freedom, freedom, American Freedom Radio. Radio. American Freedom Radio. And I hope people support American Freedom Radio. And I hope people vote with their dollars and really understand the value of having American Freedom Radio. Because that's my family. If you love me at all, Jack Blood, support American Freedom Radio. Like, my family has literally disowned me in <laughs> American Freedom Radio. Danny and Don and those guys, those are my actual family. So please, please support these guys because they have all the technology. They have all these great things that they're going to do. But obviously, they can't do it all by themselves. So not only would I like to see you support them, I'd like to see you retweet them and repost them and really get involved and get on the, the bandwagon, so to speak, on doing that do-it-yourself promotion because they're a do-it-yourself radio network, and, uh, and, and we just need that so much. Nutritious food is real body armor. It builds muscle, burns fat, improves digestion, and feeds the entire body the nutrients it needs. Did you know the U.S. government banned the hemp plant from growing in the United States and classified it as a Schedule One drug to hide it behind the marijuana plant? People have been confused about this plant for over 80 years, and many still don't know what hemp is. So now you know hemp is not marijuana, and marijuana is not hemp. They are different varieties of the same species. Hemp U.S. Hempusa.org wants the world to know these basic facts and to help people understand that hemp protein powder is the best kept health secret you need to know about. Remember, hemp protein powder contains 53% protein, is gluten-free, anti-inflammatory, non-GMO, and is loaded with nutrients. Call 888-910-4367, 888-910-4367, and see what our powder, seeds, and oil can do for you only at Hempusa.org. This is Rick Simpson, and you're listening to American Freedom Radio.